So, a quote by Sidney Decker in the book Drift into Failure, the explosive growth of software has added greatly to systems interactive complexity. And that's before the software hits. He says, with software, the possible states that a system can end up in become mind-boggling. So that's where we're all working. He talks in his book a lot about like medical systems, planes, things like that. He talks about like Boeing 747s, how they're really complicated machines. Before they take off, then they become complex as they interact with everything else. And he says, and all that's before the software even becomes involved. We can model and understand in isolation, but when released into competitive, normally regulated societies, such as the internet, our networks, data centers, their connections proliferate, their interactions and interdependencies multiply, and their complexities mushroom, and we are caught short. So I'm, I'm from Netflix. We operate one of these complex systems. We, are in, uh, we have 44 million subscribers in 41 countries, and we use up a lot of the internet bandwidth in North America. Uh, <laughs> And we, uh, we deliver, we stream uh, movies and TV shows. Years ago, we had a single data center serving just the US. That grew over time as we started to expand. And today we operate in three regions. And we migrated from our own data center to using uh, Amazon Web Services. And all of our uh, data center footprint is now sitting in Amazon Cloud Services. Our content delivery network is not there. That's spread uh, around the world in uh, peering locations and other data centers. But all of what we consider our control plane, everything that is the APIs, the web service calls, that is all sitting in Amazon cloud infrastructure. We, uh, within each of those regions, uh, Amazon regions, we operate uh, within their availability zones, three separate zones that are isolated. They're like three data centers in a box kind of a thing. And they're theoretically supposed to be decoupled from each other. Not always exactly true, as a few outages by Amazon a few years ago proved. Um, but in general, the concept is that they are independent of each other. Within each of these, we then operate hundreds of clusters. And each of these clusters has maybe one, maybe uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of machine uh, instances. The first place where we start to deal with uh, how do we react in this environment and keep our services functional despite all of the complexity and constant failure that's occurring is we assume that machine images, machine instances, are ephemeral, they're going to fail, and they die all the time. And as they fail, we just immediately uh, let them die and bring up new ones. And new ones automatically come online in, the, in what's called these auto-scaling groups. And the scaling policies know how many machine instances we're supposed to have at any given point in time, and they just bring new ones online. And since everything is stateless, it, we don't even notice that anything happened. We test all of this with some software that we call the Simeon Army. Someone was very creative in their naming. Um, they went and got a logo for it. And the first of these is uh, fairly simple, and it's called the Chaos Monkey. It's literally just a piece of software that just goes around and randomly shoots instances in the head. And so we let this thing run loose in our production environment, and it will go to clusters and just randomly pick a box and just kill it. The point of that is that it is asserting that our engineers are building software that can react to failure and be resilient. And so we are forcing ourselves uh, to handle that. If your software can't handle this, you will at one point go, why is my system all of a sudden failing? And you will receive an email saying, the chaos monkey has just killed your box. And you go, dang, I guess I should be resilient to that kind of a thing. These days, this is like a trivial affair at Netflix. It, it, no one even considers this as an issue. Chaos Monkey is just something that happens, things die, we scale up and down all day long every day. The next, uh, the next one is Chaos Gorilla, and we use this. <laughs> yep. This one typically has a war room associated to it with engineers watching what's going on when this one happens. With this one, we let it uh, wipe out a zone. So within a region, we've got uh, our infrastructure divided into three, and the theory goes is that we're operating such that we should be able to survive one of those zones dropping out, and all traffic should be able to be handled by the other, uh, the other two. And so in this case, what we do is we literally let the, sof we've, we, the software, it's a bunch of Python scripts, I think. The <laughs> <laughs> but we let it loose, we let it go and do all the API calls, and it 
it tears everything down. And what we do is we're, we're watching for the ability of our systems to be resilient to the, the latency spikes, the errors, the connection uh, issues that will happen. Occasionally you get these like weird network black holes where things go off and never return. There's interesting side effects to when you wipe out a third of your, your fleet. And so we're watching that all that works and that the other two then scale up uh, to meet the increase in demand. The next one is Chaos Kong. This, one's, this one is a new addition. He came online this last year as we, um, it took us a while, but we finally got to the point where we could run active active. We could serve one geographic uh, region from two completely independent data centers with global replication of, of data between them. So what this allows us to do is to wipe out an entire region and prove that our geographic load balancing can move back and forth and we can, stay, we can scale ourselves up and down. This also means that we need to be able to correctly shed load during that time because we, for cost and efficiency reasons, we don't run uh, both regions capable of handling everything. So what happens is this is the type of scenario that like this should be a never ever happen type of event. But what we want to be able to do is when it does happen, that we can flip the switch and during the, this one takes, you know, half hour to an hour for everything to transition, all the, you know, thousands of machines to come online. During that time, we should be able to serve the traffic that our capacity can handle, shed load on anything above that as we continue to, to launch the infrastructure to, to take the rest of the traffic. And so we do that to ourselves to prove that it can work because a disaster recovery plan such as this is pretty useless if you've never actually pulled the trigger, because it'll never work Christmas Eve when you actually need it, like we did two years ago. This is um, the three pieces of software that allow all the instances within our fleet to, to operate. These pr the principles of these have already been discussed many times. Eureka is what we use for discovery. All the instances, when they come online, they register themselves with the discovery servers. These discovery servers are the ones that have, they're the ones that have had to have lots of thought put into, you know, how do they deal with resilience and do all the distributed system stuff to make sure that they're okay. And then every other instance in the, in the system is just constantly receiving data from them, telling who everybody is in the system. Carry-on is our base server. This is just for simplicity for everyone building applications in Netflix. You just use that, it handles instance discovery and all those things. And Ribbon is our RPC client. Nothing super fancy or unique there, except for the fact that it, is, it knows how to, how to work with Eureka for discovery. So when it comes online and you want to make a call to something, you tell it which service you want to talk to, and then it worries about which instance it should actually be going to. It takes care of load balancing and fault tolerance and all those things. And it gets interesting when you're dealing with like clusters of hundreds or thousands of machines. You don't want to have connection pools and round robining over a thousand items because then you have no statistical meaning whatsoever to what errors mean. So you want to have smaller samples of your, your back end. And as you're going over these, you actually know if there's latency or errors. As we zoom now into uh, the inside of an application, a typical application in our service oriented architecture looks something like this. An incoming call uh, in turn fans out to multiple backend calls. From the edge uh, application, which I, uh, my team works on, it's the front door to Netflix. It's where all the devices come in, they hit us, and we reach out into the, the dozens and hundreds of services within Netflix. And you can have anything from a simple request of a handful into the back end, or you could have dozens of network calls into that back end. There's a form of uh, failure that none of the previous exercises tested for, and that's latency. Latency is a much different killer than infrastructure failing. Latency, if you have one of your network calls in uh, this graph that all of a sudden goes latent, it can block and saturate all resources within an entire cluster within seconds. I've seen systems that are operating at 50 to 100,000 RPS fall over dead in one to two seconds. Because at that rate, if something that is normally a five millisecond call all of a sudden goes to five seconds, every queue in your system is saturated and falls over. And so what this does to a system is if you have even something that you call four nines, but then you multiply that by the number of systems that you have, that 0.01% of error multiplied out actually is not that great of a downtime, uh, up, uptime if 
you are the sum of all of those things. And so even if each of them, if I'm talking to 30 backend systems, even if each of them is four nines, I actually, because I rely upon all of them, if I allow their failures to propagate up to me, I at best can be 99.7. And it's always worse than that. When a system fails, it's never for like a minute. It's always like half an hour or an hour, because who knows what's going on. And so a couple years ago, this is kind of the state that uh, Netflix was getting itself into. It had been racing into the cloud, racing into the streaming business, and standing up everything, and fault tolerance, resilience principles had kind of been a little weak in places. And so we went about trying to solve that. And some of the constraints of what we were building for is, first of all, at Netflix, speed of iteration is a big deal. We're not a bank. If we make a mistake, we're not like bankrupting somebody or a company. We're not a nuclear reactor. We can, uh, <laughs> we can afford to deploy code that might have some bugs, and then we'll just roll forward. We just, we'll just keep pushing. And so that, that was one item. Client libraries, in our service-oriented architecture, because of the first point about speed, we've optimized for service teams providing client libraries so that if I have a dozen consumers, they just all take my library and consume me. Instead of this, we, we've accepted this slight coupling between our systems rather than making each of those dozen consumers all write their own client against me. We're also a mixed environment. We're a polyglot JVM, we've got Java, Groovy, Scala, Clojure, whatever, all those different languages. And then there's the occasional uh, Python app and other things in the system. And so what we wanted to do, we knew that we needed to be doing bulkheading to isolate all these different connection points. And another, side, uh, another uh, c constraint of our system is that the majority of it is blocking uh, RPC. I know, I know, it's, everyone here will, will uh, harass about that. We've already seen that that's not what we want. Um, but that's the nature of, of what, what we've got. And a lot of that is because it's worked for years and years. That's how the code base has been built. There's 10 years behind it. And uh, we, we're looking at and prototyping solutions like Netty. But even if we start to move to that, we've got a lot of blocking uh, network calls that we're making. So that's another constraint. And so when I'm going to start isolating these things, I need to take into account a lot of things. Any one of these client calls can be performing logic on my server that's doing argument validation, it might be doing cache lookups, uh, might make routing decisions. It has all the serialization logic that can blow up at any point in time. That is the actual network call, then deserializing it, and then post logic to deserialize, do whatever it's going to do, right? So I can fail at any one of those points or inject latency. That's what a production system looks like when one of these things goes bad. So in this particular example, the, the green and the red invert, because one of the underlying systems went latent and wiped out the entire production cluster. That is exactly what we don't want to have happen. And if you look at the stack traces down below, it's literally just like a, a create socket on something that's just sitting there. And if you looked at all the stack traces in every single box in our cluster, this was before we had any sort of isolation in place, every thread in the whole cluster was pinned on that. So we want bulkheading. We want to be able to isolate that failure and allow the, the user request to be degraded or at least shed load. So on the Reactive Manifesto site, you'll see this image. Picture of a ship, bulkheads in it. We wanted those bulkheads. And so we went about building that. And so we built these bulkheads that would allow us to uh, isolate each point where we did network uh, traffic interaction so that we could gain back control of, uh, basically allow us to control what our interaction was with that back end and walk away from it uh, if we wanted to, or be able to control a different response if it was failing. And that allows us to degrade in different ways and take back control of our, uh, of our machines. Richard Cook, another who writes on these systems, said, overt ca catastrophic failure occurs when small, apparently innocuous failures join to create opportunities for a systemic accident. This is exactly what happens in service-oriented architectures. Very little things all gang up on you, and they have really interesting like, complexities is how they come together. And uh, if you read later in what they talk about, these, these people who, who study complex systems theory, 
They basically tell you, like, don't even bother trying to figure out what the root cause was. Like, it, you just, it, it's beyond human comprehension. That's why we call them complex systems. So this is what we're dealing with as we're building these big distributed systems. He also says system operations are dynamic with components being organizational, human, or technical, failing and being replaced continuously. And so we, we embrace that. We take that to heart. I showed earlier how we deal with that at the infrastructure level. We allow uh, machines to just completely fail, go away, bring new ones online. We also act like that at the software level. And we're not built on an actor system because that's, we have a whole legacy of not being on actors. And so we've brought some of those principles of letting things fail and just moving forward into the RPC world that we're in. So we went and built some software, later gave it a cool logo and name that allows us to uh, isolate around each of these network calls. And really it comes down to two basic principles that we use for this. We either put a triable semaphore in front of something that is just restricting the concurrent access to something, and it is sized such that under all normal operations, uh, there's plenty of, of throughput for the, the normal healthy uh, execution. If latency starts to occur, you quickly saturate the, the available concurrent limit on the semaphore, and then, then you start not being able to get that semaphore, but instead of blocking on the semaphore, when you try it, you fail to retrieve it, and you just return. And, then, and I'll show you a little bit later, you have lots of choices as to what to do at that point when you return. The other type we use is thread pools whenever we're dealing with something that's blocking. So these blocking uh, network calls, unfortunately, the, it does have an overhead, of course, but we've chosen to accept the overhead of the extra thread for the resilience capabilities. We literally put a thread pool around every single uh, network client that we're going to be interacting with. In our edge servers, uh, there are some in here who will fall over dead when I tell you this, but we'll have like 50 thread pools each individually allocated to each of the different backend network clients that, we'll, that we're dealing with. And generally, only a handful of those threads are ever active, but it allows us to have uh, the, the concurrency restrictions and the ability to time out and walk away from what would otherwise completely tie up our threads. And so we use triable semaphores for non-blocking clients and, and uh, fallback protection, separate threads for blocking clients, and then we do aggressive timeouts so we can just walk away from something and move on. And then we also do have uh, circuit breakers on top of this as well. It's kind of a release valve. Circuit breakers always get way too much credit. They are, your system's dead by the time the circuit breaker kicks in if you don't have the concurrency limits. The bulkheads have to be there. And then the circuit breaker can just release pressure and just like stop pounding you. But in that time gap between I just went from five milliseconds to five seconds, and the time the circuit breaker has enough data to go, yep, that thing's dead, you're already saturated in toast. And so it's the bulk heading that's the most important thing. So the way that this looks for us is we'll come in, and uh, we create, treat it like a command pattern, and for every network call we're gonna make, we construct this command object, and then you can choose one of the three execution uh, models for it. The synchronous execute, asynchronous um, uh, queuing with a future, and then asynchronous observable using Rx for callbacks. We support all three because there's all different contexts where we're using this within our company. As it executes, it asks two questions. Is the circuit closed or open? And am I being rate limited or not? Have I met the, the, the concurrency limit? If both of those things are positive, then I am allowed to execute, and I execute my payload, which does the, typically a, a network call. And in a successful case, it returns the response just as it would in any other time, and then it provides a feedback loop that just comes back into the metrics and the circuit breaker. On a failure case, it doesn't matter. This is where the, it starts to enable us to be resilient. It doesn't matter what type of failure it occurs. It could be short-circuited because um, the, the circuit breaker's tripped. It could be limiting me on concurrency, or the actual execution underneath could, could blow up and fail, or it could be a timeout and all of them get routed through the exact same fallback logic. And then that fallback could do one of three things. Either it's not implemented, in which case I just throw the exception and it's the equivalent of shedding load and just failing fast. It could have a fallback implemented, but the fallback itself fails, which is never a great thing. And again, we just treat that as you're throwing an error and uh, shedding load. Or preferably you have a fallback that's a that allows you to degrade gracefully. 
So I'm going to go through some of those uh, graceful degradation cases. Because just if I have a system that's failing, I have, let's say I have 30 different backend systems, and one of them goes down for 20 minutes, I would really rather not just be showing all my users come back later. I would rather be able to degrade the experience in some way so that maybe the, it's not as optimal, maybe it's not as personalized, maybe their preferences aren't exactly the same, but I'd rather be able to get them to the critical path of selecting something to watch and watching it. That's a far preferable experience. So the default case is when the command is, is implemented, there is no fallback, it executes the code, and then all that can happen is if, if, if there's no fallback implemented, it just blows up, and we consider this just um, failing fast. You, you just, you're doing load shedding. The next best thing is fail silently. In this case, you're basically returning a no-op. Some type of data uh, element that for, for that particular command makes sense. If it's a list of videos, I can return an empty list. If it's a, a bookmark, so at Netflix, a bookmark is where you are in the video, I can just return zero. There was a time in our system that if I could not get your bookmark, I completely prevented you from watching a movie. It makes no sense. Just because you were 10 minutes into it, you know, left and came back, you are capable of fast forwarding if I can't get you your bookmark. Um, that was a pretty silly place to be. Now, if you're ever wondering and you're watching Netflix and you, uh, and you come in and you're like, wait a second, why isn't this getting me back to where I was? Probably because you're in fallback. And we're just starting you at the beginning. Static fallback is the case where it's like some uh, personal preference, but it, we've lost that, so we're going to give you a default instead. A stubbed fallback is something where we're able to take parts of your request, part static, and join them together into some kind of default representation that allows your user interface to continue functioning, but you might not have like your social friends or your color preference or whatever it is. More complicated ones are when we start uh, going over networks for fallback. And so the first one, we, we have a lot of use cases where you go to the real-time system for like your personalized data. If, that, if we're not able to get your personalized data, we'll fall back to the, the most recent cache data that's in the same group of users as you are. And then if we can't get that one, then we'll go to some local like global just default. And like at that point, we just say, here, watch the Avengers, and we're done with it. <laughs> and of course, failing fast is, is uh, if nothing else. So in complex systems, decision makers are locally rather than globally rational. So we've just seen how we are writing in our code to make these local decisions. On every single one of our servers, they're all making these decisions. I might be timing out from here while that guy over there is totally fine. And so it's all these local decisions. But that doesn't mean that their decisions cannot lead to global or system-wide events. And most definitely that's not. These local actions can have global results. So if I go and implement a fallback, but don't take into account how everyone else is consuming that data, I could totally break everything just the same as if I didn't have anything in place. So we try and audit this through simulation. So this is a particular dashboard when we were doing some latency simulation. And uh, I remember this one because we were sitting there and we were, uh, this is latency monkey as we call it, we were injecting latency into one of these backend services. We flipped the switch and then seconds later on this, uh, this UI is a reactive UI that it's about a one second latency from the time events happen on our servers to the time they show up on this. And we saw the one that circled go red, which we expected because we were making him fail. But the one on the right, we killed the Apple TV. Like dead, killed it. Um, so we saw this, went, roll back the test right now. Boom, we rolled it back. So start to finish was about 30 seconds that we had killed Apple TV for everybody. But now we had seen this in a controlled environment. We had seen it when we could control it in the 30 second window rather than some period of time later when a real production issue happens and it's ours potentially while all other devices are happy but not Apple TV. We fixed the bug that was Apple TV was making assumptions about the data that it shouldn't have been in the code. We fixed it, rolled that out, repeated the test. We were completely resilient to it. And that service could be completely offline, and all the devices would be resilient to it. Here's another example where we did a test where we increased the latency from median of 125 milliseconds up to about 1,500 milliseconds. And so on that graph, you can see the spike as we inject it. 
And you can see here the fallbacks uh, that we're returning spike up to 5,000 per second, yet the exceptions thrown is, is only around one per second. And so we're handling those errors and preventing the user from seeing them. So all that thus far has been about how we handle the infrastructural problems of things. I'd like to move on now to another aspect of how we're, we've built a system that can be responsive in, in more ways than just technical. We also need to be responsive to the human and business elements. So we're constantly changing things and constantly uh, deploying new code. So in one of these clusters, we're deploying to uh, dozens and dozens of times a day across all the clusters in Netflix. And even on our big edge system, which is the front door, which is the biggest um, system we've got, we're capable of deploying it multiple times a day if we want. So we consider continuous um, delivery as a readiness to deliver. It doesn't mean that we push every build, but uh, we push a couple times a week, but any build that we want, we can push the button and it uh, automatically goes out the door. All the clusters be, uh, behind uh, the edge are all routed through this layer that uh, we call Zool, uh, the Ghost, Ghostbusters guy. Um, that has a really scary logo. I wasn't, I, for whatever reason, I forgot to put it in here. Um, and so this routing layer allows us to accept all incoming traffic and then make uh, decisions as to where we want to route this traffic based upon request headers, even payload body if we want. And one of the more important ones is every single deployment that we do, the build first goes through canary testing. And so we have a, uh, a set of software that is all about allowing us to manage our deployment pipelines. And so this represents every single, uh, this, not every single, this represents uh, a selection of um, commits to our master and prod branches at the particular time I took the snapshots. And then all the, um, the green and red and blue circles are representing the different steps of our continuous build pipeline that it's going through. In this case, one of these uh, went all the way up to the canary point and it didn't do so well. It only uh, scored a 77 on our canary score. So that one did not go to prod. The blue one is the one that's currently building. This is the commit that represents the current point of our production environment. And so as we're looking through our Git logs, you can see the exact um, point in our uh, Git commits that matches up with what's currently running in production. And you can see all the environments it's in. I, I cut off the, the full list of environments here. Um, but it would be in multiple different clusters, one of them being the big one that takes the majority of traffic. And so you can see right there in the corner that this one scored a 99% on our canary. And I'll explain the canary a little bit more in a few minutes. Other, it allows us to look at different environments. So we have in, uh, in the production uh, Amazon, uh, we have production and test. And within production, we have int staging and to test clusters. And so we can deploy the same binary uh, machine image into different clusters for different purposes. We're, um, just quickly scan through these. We have different mechanisms that allow us to come in and see what the history is of a different build. I can see what this binary has gone through, which tests it went through, who's touched it, whose commits are in it, which environments it's in. I'm able to go in and see what's in a current cluster right now. I can see what all the scores are on that thing. I can pick it and see a, what, which environment are you in so I can go interact with you. And then I could say, I want to take this now and schedule it to be deployed. And the deployment takes into account which region of the world you're in, so you, it knows like preferable times to, to schedule deployment. Even though we can push at any time, we typically avoid doing major deployments like right in the middle of peak hours in a different, uh, different region. And so we'll schedule Europe off hours, US East and West, all in different uh, times of the day. And so you, this, this is telling you right in your face when it's planning on scheduling it and what the time zones are and all that type of thing. And then I can come in and I can say, of all the recent builds, show me where there are in the pipeline. How many can have canaries been um, run on these things? Which environments are they in? And all this leads us to these canary reports. And the way that we run these canaries is we, uh, we launch two clusters simultaneously, one that is the exact binary machine image that's from production, and then the new machine image, which is the, the one that we uh, want to deploy. And we launch three instances of each at the exact same time. They run for an hour. Depending upon the metrics at that point, it will then scale them up to nine instances in each. 
and then it, let it lets the two run for some period of time and then compares the metrics between them. We launch both uh, baseline and canary at the same time because the things like garbage collection behavior and just life cycle of machines, if you compare them when they're, they have different durations that they've been alive, the, the metrics are just really choppy to try and compare. So we just launch them at the exact same time. And so we start to compare things like um, successes and errors, and we mark metrics that are cold and hot, um, ones that are lower than baseline, ones that are hotter than baseline. And we, it, of the tens of thousands of metrics that we actually capture in our boxes, we've got about a thousand that we use to decide if a box is uh, worthy of being pushed into production. Here is one that didn't make it. And so this is the type of a, a report that we'll see if something is misperforming. Um, so as an example, I'm working on getting a, uh, I typically am working on the libraries like Rx and Hystrix and things like that, that affect every single uh, invocation in our systems. And so I, I, I let my canaries run for quite a long time on those ones. And I've been fighting with a, a particular release for the last three weeks where I keep getting that kind of a score. Um, and so this is a great test where everything might look good in dev and test and that stuff, but when you put it in production, everything is different. And in our environment, test is actually kind of meaningless to know if the code is ready. And so everything goes into production for testing. This is an example of the, um, some of the different environments that we also have for production. So stable does not mean that the other ones are unstable. This means that that one does not have auto-scaling policies applied to it, so that this here when we launch a box, that box will stay there until it gets killed. Whereas in an auto-scale uh, cluster, boxes can come and go at any point in time. We use this one to watch longer-term uh, memory behavior of boxes, or if I want just some long-running tests, we drop it in there. Squeeze and debug and coal mine, I'll start talking about it now. So squeeze testing is another thing that we do. So the Zool layer allows us to say, you have some thousands of boxes behind you. I want to take exactly the right percentage of traffic to ramp that one box up five RPS at a time every couple minutes and just keep uh, moving it up until we break it. And so we, that, the Zool layer does that. Um, yeah, it, it, it allows us to test these boxes and find out where they break. We take that uh, data and use it in two ways. One, to assert whether or not our performance is degrading and our throughput capabilities, but it also feeds into our auto scale uh, policies that I'll show in a little bit. So that every single machine image, we know what RPS it's capable of handling before it tips over. And because of that, every machine image that goes in, it, it recalculates how many instances we need in our cluster to actually handle the, the traffic. So the reason why we do this on every single machine image is because in a, in a large environment like us where there's hundreds of different engineers all doing things, we pick up some library that it might look great in test. It gets into production and under the stresses of normal of production, it may drop our ca capacity by 10 RPS. And that kind of a margin could all of a sudden make it so that we don't have enough instances in our cluster. And we can make a decision at that point. It's like, is this, should we even be deploying this machine or not? And we can back off and instead choose to go fix it. Or we may say, no, we got to get this code out there. We're going to pay for extra hardware for right now, get it out, and then we'll loop back around, go fix the performance problem, and fix it for the next release. The coal mine is a different type of canary. The normal canary takes care of the pre-release testing. The coal mine is a long-lived canary, so canary in the coal mine. Um, so the coal mine take, it has the same code running as is in the production fleet, except um, it has extra monitoring enabled through Java agents, and we're watching all network traffic um, down at the, like the, the Java, uh, it, it captures the NIO and IO, blocking IO, input and output of the JVM, and it's looking for primarily any sort of network traffic that shows up that is unisolated. The way that this can happen is if someone writes code that is behind some like property that is not turned on when we do our original uh, canary testing, and then some days later they flip a switch, and then all of a sudden this new network route shows up on our production code. And 
we want to know about those things because we've had outages where it's like, where did this network call just come from? One of the funniest ones we ever saw was something that all of a sudden started trying to validate its XML against some third-party website. <laughs> and so this, this like alerts us and tell, tells us those things in near real time. This one, we, it doesn't matter if it's seconds, but it's within minutes, all of a sudden we start getting these emails like, hey, I just saw some network traffic show up that should not be here. And so we use the coal mine for that type of stuff. The main production cluster, which is what takes the majority of traffic, is where our prim the primary focus of this guy is to be able to scale up and down to meet traffic needs. And our traffic patterns, you can pretty well tell the time of day by them. And it's about a six times multiple from um, trough to peak. And you'll notice that our weekends and, uh, are a little different. So the weekends, have their higher peaks, and they also, the, in the middle of the day, you'll notice that they're, they're fatter uh, than the weekdays. And across the, the time, especially Saturday mornings, when you hit the, the curve in the bottom, like it hits that point where it's zero and it's like infinite as far as the, uh, all the math, it's like, yeah, I'm totally stable. And then it like curves up. All the kids wake up and start watching whatever they watch. <laughs> so that's a real problem for auto scaling. That curve is so fast that we, uh, when we were doing reactive scaling, this is going to be one of those times when I actually say reactive wasn't enough. Um, the reactive auto scaling was insufficient for this, and we actually had to buffer it by like over 30%. We had to set floors so that we would never let our fleet go down to that uh, low point. Because if we did, the, we couldn't scale up fast enough to handle it. Part of that is because we, we have chosen to ha allow our startup time to be in the neighborhood of 10-ish minutes, give or take. Um, the trade-off of that is we're able to pull in a lot more data um, for caching, and have, uh, we have pretty large heaps, like 20 gig heaps, and um, it allows the machine to run much better once it's running. If we, could run, if we could launch a box in 30 seconds, it'd be a very different scenario, but then we'd be trading off in far higher network calls, um, we'd be pounding these caches all day long when we, it's better for us to have them in, internally. So we went and built something that, because our, our model is so predictive, you can tell like where you are, we went and built this thing, which allows us to predict. And this is, uh, the blue is the predicted curve, and allows us to set our fleet exactly where we want it to be, and we come in and we just set this, I can't remember if it's every half hour or every hour, and we just, we move up and down the curve to what we want it to be, and then the reactive uh, policy is just running in the background in case it, it, the prediction is ever wrong and it needs to be higher than that. This is an interesting case where uh, I use this one purposefully to show uh, what the reactive one would have done versus what the predicted did in the case of an outage. Same thing with Super Bowl. Um, those types of events. Reactive, what it ha so re uh, Super Bowl, ha uh, what happens is you're coming along, everyone flips channels, drops, halftime, funny enough, starts again, comes, drops, people actually watch the game, um, and, it, and it comes up again. Well, that wreaks havoc on reactive uh, auto-scaling systems, because they think, oh, the traffic's going away, so I'm, down, I'm scaling down, and then it comes back with a wall of traffic, and you're like, whoa, now I'm like trying to start back all my servers. Predictive allows us to know that that's, this is an anomaly, keep my fleet at that size and just ride it out. And so this works very well for these anomalous events and for, um, um, uh, outages in such scenarios. It also allowed our, uh, our machines to just be much healthier because they're not handling those spikes as reactive as kicking in. And so you can see on the left uh, here is before we enabled Scryer, on the right is when we enabled it, and it leveled out the load averages on our machines. It also allowed us to be a little tighter in our allocation. So the, the blue is how many machine instances we needed to have uh, with reactive because we had to buffer more. And the red is where we're able to be when we applied the predictive with it so that we could uh, not have such a high buffer to handle those curves. The next type of being responsive uh, to our business is we have dozens of UIs across 1,000 plus devices, and we're typically running hundreds of different A-B tests across our systems. And what these are are the, the product de developers are coming up with different ideas as to how to change the, the, the product. 
And we're a very data-driven business, and so they want to be able to put out two, three, four different variants of it and test it on the customers. What that means for us as the engineers is we are constantly changing our code. And so at the edge, what we decided to do, and we decided to just get out of the way of that. We, we didn't want to be involved anymore. And so we actually decided that we were going to, instead of us building the web services for the UI teams, we decided to become just a platform for web services and allow the UI teams to just build their own endpoints on top of us. Um, for that and several other reasons. And so what this means is that we actually allow each of the different devices like PlayStation or Xbox or wherever to build and deploy a, a web service on top of us. And it runs in a JVM runtime. We have chosen to use Groovy at that layer uh, at this point, but we support any of the different polyglot languages. And then the code, believe it or not, comes from Cassandra. This is when you all like go hide somewhere. So, it doesn't matter what data store it is, we just decided to use that one for one key reason, two. First, because it was already there. Second, because it gives us global replication for free. Otherwise, if I was using S3 or GitHub or something like that, I'd have to worry about like, replicating across all the regions myself. So we just leverage the global replication Cassandra gives us. When the code gets pulled in to the machines that are running, then they, uh, we made the decision that they would not be allowed to write synchronous code. It is all asynchronous, because we did not want the engineers at that level to be worrying about the primitives of concurrency, because their whole purpose here is composing multiple different network calls. And we didn't want anyone to have to be worrying about synchronization and threads and pools and volatiles and all those types of things. And so we chose, this, is the, the, this was the point where we found, uh, where we discovered and chose to adopt uh, the Rx programming model. Uh, as you've already seen some great uh, demonstrations of it, uh, it is uh, an asynchronous version of the iterable. And so what we did is we went from having a blocking API where everything was a normal synchronous call, you go and get something, and if you wanted to do it asynchronously, you'd have to wrap it in a thread in, with the future and all those things. We converted our entire service layer over to returning observables instead of um, synchronous type Ts. And here's what some, here, this is a representation of the type of code combining Hystrix, our fault tolerance layer, with Rx. This is the type of use case that drove us to this pattern. This is not exactly like what we run in, in uh, uh, production just because I've simplified it and I, chose, I used Java 8 for this. We haven't yet moved up to Java 8 in production. But what we see here is when I first come in, the first thing that I have to get, I'm ignoring other things like geo calls and stuff like that, just the, the critical path. I need to come in and I fetch the user data based upon the, the request parameter. Typically, it's not a request parameter, it's a cookie or security token of some kind. And it is now asynchronously waiting on the callback for that user. As I flat map over it, it just sits there and waits for that network request to finish and brings back the user object. The first, when I'm inside now the flat map, I've received that user object back. The next thing I do is I kick off another network request through another asynchronous command to go fetch the personalized catalog. This is, if you've ever used Netflix, it's the grid of TV shows and movies. I also kick off another call in parallel, the social uh, command. This goes off and gets, your, if you're linked up on Facebook, it gets your friends and all those things. These two things are completely independent of each other. I can go fetch them in parallel. I flat map over the personalized catalog. As the catalog comes back, it's going to give me a catalog list that then has a further observable of videos. So I get an observable of videos, so a list of videos asynchronously, sorry, a list of lists, and then on each of those lists, it's a list of videos. And so think of my grid, list of lists, videos going this way. So now I'm getting the videos, and I flat map over each video in that list, and then for every video, I want to kick off three uh, further network calls. Bookmark command, ratings, and metadata. Now, in reality, this is all doing automatic batching behind the scenes. We are not kicking off like 100 network calls in reality. But the engineers get to just write their code like this so that semantically is what they, they're thinking and how they want to be working with it. Those three things then are zipped together so that I, um, and then I'm just hand waving over the combine. The combine just takes those domain objects, turns them into whatever domain you want. That's not cool. Never had that happen. <laughs> See, this is where I should have another laptop, right? And just drop it in. <laughs> I've seen people do that at presentations before. 
No, that's not it. Oh, come on. All right, so as I zip over that, at the very end of this now, I've got these two asynchronous observables that are off doing all this stuff, but they're just dangling at this point. And I merge them back together, and this is where, uh, we actually don't do this yet in production because our devices uh, don't yet support it, but this is where we're headed towards. Instead of me uh, zipping these things together into one scalar response and one big JSON payload, which is what we do today because our clients uh, ha haven't been ready yet for a true streaming WebSocket uh, system, I'm demonstrating here how I'm actually taking each list of videos and, and the social data, just as they come back, I'm just emitting them out as uh, new server sent events down the stream. And so our device code is actually already set up to handle this. If you ever see a talk by Jafra Hussein on who's completely uh, moved all of the Netflix UIs over to using reactive programming, reactive extensions, they're already set up to handle them like this. We're just working on getting WebSocket support at our scale. And we'll be able to move to the point where all of our data would actually flow like this uh, instead of creating one big JSON payload and shoving it down the pipe. So what we do today is instead of each of these elements, we then basically do a reduce and pull it all together and ship it down as one big blob. And this is why we chose to adopt Rx at this level, because there is nested conditional logic here that is just a royal pain to do in most other ways. Um, Scala futures, uh, Twitter futures, Akka futures all do this equally well. The, the only thing this gives us a little differently is that we can work on vectors as well as uh, scalar responses which work well for our lists of videos and things like that. And then we're able to leverage the exact same programming model in some of the stream processing systems that we're building. And they're com it's completely exact same programming model. And so all of this then sits on top of the Hystrix layer. Uh, in my example, I'm invoking Hystrix directly just for simplicity and for clarity. In our uh, real production system, that's all hidden behind a service layer. And we just expose these observable uh, methods. And what this allowed us to do is all of our devices now have optimized endpoints that are custom built just for them. What we found is that the one size fits all model was not working for us. We had a lowest common denominator RESTful API that made every device just kind of sacrifice things to be able to use this common API. We now allow every device to custom build their, the, their web service to be exactly what they need to have the highest performance for their device. And we, we got out of the way and let them write that code on our layer, and they can deploy whenever they want. And when they push a new endpoint, it deploys in, in under a minute across our uh, cluster. This represents how in our three different environments in the, pr in the prod ecosystem, uh, it's all the various endpoints that have been deployed, these groovy scripts that have been deployed. We can track uh, who's uploading them, when, when they've been activated, if you roll back. You can even do multivariate testing between them. Like you can activate different percentage allocations on two different revisions of an endpoint and um, see how they do. And then we also track things like uh, deprecated methods, uh, who's using them, so we can go hunt them down and tell them to move on to new code, and like who the, the, the biggest endpoints are and those types of things. Failure happens. Uh, it will happen is, is the point of a system like this. And so Hystrix allows us to monitor that in real time. And so in this case, what we see is this particular endpoint, uh, we're, this is a service for getting social data, not an endpoint, this is a social service. It was failing at this point due to latency. Um, I can see that because the orange is timeout. And so it's isolating that. Everything else around it is green. It's completely bulkheaded from everyone else. And the interesting thing here is that even though we've gone very simple at the instance level, it's not trying to be adaptive at the instance level, level as far as like how long do I trip my circuit or not. At the cluster level, though, you see it start to adapt. There's a difference between single node and cluster level. And at the cluster level, it's interesting watching one of these things. It just kind of ebbs and flows back and forth as like different instances making their local decisions are opening and closing based upon their view of the world. And the system as a whole adapts to the current state. 
In this case, we see another one that was failing with a 20% error rate, and we can see the error rate spiking while the fallbacks pick up. And then this is what the real-time um, dashboard for us looks like. And so this is just a video capture of it. And so we monitor about 250 of these. And this uh, was a dashboard that we wrote with D3 and its uh, server sent events. And we are just, so this is representing at this point only a few hundred servers. And it is aggregating that stream and then piping it into the browser and then just reactively, uh, similar to what you saw earlier in the, in the uh, reactive trader, this is rendering it to the screen uh, in one to two second latency from the time all these events are happening on the servers. When everything's healthy, it's just pretty. When things are going bad, this has become mission critical for us to be able to have this type of data. It used to be that we would have to wait several minutes to see the normal historical metrics tick along at their, their one minute latency or whatever they would, and five minutes later you have five data points. This now is giving us a data point per second to be able to make immediate decisions about whatever is going on. You push a property change, you see what's happening. You um, change config somewhere else, I can immediately see the impact. If we fix something, I can immediately see if it, it gets solved. Where we're headed is, this is a mock-up of where we're going. We have liked our, the impact of real-time monitoring so much that we spun up a team for that. This is a mock-up of fully, this would be a full real-time uh, system that would allow us to uh, analyze every possible element of our systems. It's pretty cool watching this thing start to come to life. Um, and the goal is to be able to, at any point in time, be able to inspect in real-time uh, anywhere across our globe, and this is a, it's more than just being able to consume the events that are firing through our systems. We, 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 can, cons we can produce more data than we're willing or to pay for to persist at all, so we want our reactive systems to be able to say, I'm interested in this, reach out and subscribe to that data in those servers over there, and stream it back to me just while I'm watching it, and then when I unsubscribe, it stops um, looking at it. So in conclusion, complex systems run as broken systems. The system continues to function because it contains so many redundancies and because people can make it function despite the presence of many flaws. This is true. This is exactly how these big distributed systems work. There's always something somewhere broken. And the important thing for us to be responsive and resilient is that we are uh, building systems that are capable of constantly handling failure. And uh, failure is just a natural part of these systems. More information can be found in all these places, um, open source, tech blogs, blog posts, et cetera, and you can come and harass me with questions after. Thanks. <laughs>